Chapter 7 of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Around Yosemite Walls. Late in the afternoon of October 5, 1864, a party of us reached the edge of Yosemite and looking down into the valley, saw that the summer haze had been banished from the region by autumnal frosts and wind. We looked in the gulf through air as clear as a vacuum, discerning small objects upon valley floor and cliff front. That splendid afternoon shadow which divides the face of El Capitan was projected far up and across the valley, cutting it in halves, one a mosaic of russets and yellows, with dark pine and glimpse of white river, the other a cobalt blue zone, in which the familiar groves and meadows were suffused with shadow tones. It is hard to conceive a more pointed contrast than this same view in October and June. Then, through a slumberous yet transparent atmosphere, you look down upon emerald freshness of green, upon arrowy rush of swollen river, and here and there, among pearly cliffs, as from the clouds, tumbles silver-white dust of cataracts. The voice of full, soft wind swells up over rustling leaves, and pulsating throbs like the beating of far-off surf. All stern sublimity, all geological terribleness, are veiled away behind magic curtains of cloud shadow and broken light. Misty brightness, glow of cliff and sparkle of foam, wealth of beautiful details, the charm of pearl and emerald, cool gulfs of violet shade stretching back in deep recesses of the walls, these are the features which lie under the June sky. Now all that has gone. The shattered fronts of walls stand out terrible and sharp, sweeping down in broken crag and cliff to a valley whereon the shadow of autumnal death has left its solemnity. There is no longer an air of beauty. In this cold, naked strength, one has crowded on him the geological record of mountain work, of granite plateau suddenly rent asunder, of the slow, imperfect manner in which nature has vainly striven to smooth her rough work and bury the ruins with thousands of years' accumulation of soil and debris. Already late, we hurried to descend the trail and were still following it when darkness overtook us, but ourselves and the animals were so well acquainted with every turn that we found no difficulty in continuing our way to Longhurst's house, and here we camped for the night. By an act of Congress, the Yosemite Valley had been segregated from the public domain and given, donated, as they call it, to the state of California, to be held inalienable for all time as a public pleasure ground. The commission into whose hands this trust devolved had sent Mr. Gardner and myself to make a survey defining the boundaries of the new grant. It was necessary to execute this work before the legislature should meet in December, and we undertook the work, knowing very well that we must use the utmost haste in order to escape a three months' imprisonment. For in early winter the immense Sierra snowfalls would close the doors of mountain trails and we should be unable to reach the lowlands until the following spring. The party consisted of my companion, Mr. Gardner, Mr. Frederick A. Clark, who had been detailed from the service of the Mariposa Company to assist us, Longhurst, an habitué of the valley, a weather-beaten, round-the-worlder, whose function in the party was to tell yarns, sing songs, and feed the inner man, Cotter and Wilmer, chain men, and two mules, one who was blind, and the other who, I aver, would have discharged his duty very much better without eyes. We had chosen as the headquarters of the survey two little cabins under the pine trees near Black's Hotel. They were central, 
they offered us a shelter, and from their doors, which opened almost upon the Merced itself, we obtained a most delightful sunrise view of the Yosemite. Next morning, in spite of early outcries from Longhurst, and a warning solo of his performed with spoon and fry pan, we lay in our comfortable blankets pretending to enjoy the effect of sunrise light upon the Yosemite cliff and fall, all of us unwilling to own that we were tired out and needed rest. Breakfast had waited an hour or more when we got a little weary of beds and yielded to the temptation of appetite. A family of Indians, consisting of two huge girls and their parents, sat silently waiting for us to commence and, after we had begun, watched every mouthful from the moment we got it successfully impaled upon the camp forks, a cloud darkening their faces as it disappeared forever down our throats. But we quite lost our spectators when Longhurst came upon the boards as a flapjack friar, a role to which he bent his whole intelligence, and with entire success. Scorning such vulgar accomplishment as turning the cake over in midair, he slung it boldly up, turning it three times, ostentatiously greasing the pan with a fine centrifugal movement, and catching the flapjack as it fluttered down, and spanked it upon the hot coals with a touch at once graceful and masterly. I failed to enjoy these products, feeling as if I were breakfasting in sacrilege upon works of art. Not so our Indian friends, who wrestled affectionately for frequent unfortunate cakes which would dodge Longhurst and fall into the ashes. By night we had climbed to the top of the northern wall, camping at the headwaters of a small brook, named by emotional Mr. Hutchings, I believe, the Virgin's Tears because from time to time under the brow of a cliff just south of El Capitan there may be seen a feeble waterfall. I suspect this sentimental pleasantry is intended to bear some relation to the bridal veil fall opposite. If it has any such force at all, it is a melancholy one, given by unusual gauntness and an aged aspect, and by the few evanescent tears which this old virgin sheds. A charming campground was formed by bands of russet meadow wandering in vistas through a stately forest of dark green fir trees unusually feathered to the base. Little mahogany-colored pools surrounded with sphagnum lay at the meadows, offering pleasant contrast of color. Our campground was among clumps of thick firs which completely walled in the fire and made close overhanging shelters for table and beds. Gardner, Cotter, and I felt thankful to our thermometer for owning up frankly the chill of the next morning as we left a generous campfire and marched off through fir forest and among brown meadows and bare ridges of rock toward El Capitan. This grandest of granite precipices is capped by a sort of forehead of stone sweeping down to level, severe brows which jut out a few feet over the edge. A few weather-beaten, battle-twisted, and black pines cling in the clefts, contrasting in force with the solid white stone. We hung our barometer upon a stunted tree quite near the brink and, climbing cautiously down, stretched ourselves out upon an overhanging block of granite and looked over into the Yosemite Valley. The rock fell under us in one sheer sweep, 3,200 feet. Upon its face we could trace the lines of fracture and all prominent lithological changes. Directly beneath, outspread like a delicately tinted chart, lay the lovely park of Yosemite, winding in and out about the solid white feet of precipices which sunk into it on either side, its sunlit surface invaded by the shadow of the south wall, its spires of pine, open expanses of buff and drab meadow, and families of umber oaks rising as background for the vivid green river margin and flaming orange masses of frosted cottonwood foliage. Deep in front, 
the bridal veil brook made its way through the bottom of an open gorge and plunged off the edge of a thousand-foot cliff, falling in white water dust and drifting in pale, translucent clouds out over the treetops of the valley. Directly opposite us, and forming the other gatepost of the valley's entrance, rose the great mass of cathedral rocks, a group quite suggestive of the Florence Duomo. But our grandest view was eastward, above the deep sheltered valley and over the tops of those terrible granite walls, out upon rolling ridges of stone and wonderful granite domes. Nothing in the whole list of eruptive products, except volcanoes themselves, is so wonderful as these dome mountains. They are of every variety of conoidal form, having horizontal sections accurately elliptical, ovoid, or circular, and profiles varying from such semicircles as the cap behind the sentinel to the graceful infinite curves of the North Dome. Above and beyond these stretch back long, bare ridges connecting with sunny summit peaks. The whole region is one solid granite mass, with here and there shallow soil layers and a thin, variable forest which grows in picturesque mode, defining the leading lines of erosion as an artist deepens here and there a line to hint at some structural peculiarity. A complete physical exposure of the range from summit to base lay before us. At one extreme stand, sharpened peaks, white in fretwork of glistening ice bank, or black where tower straight bolts of snowless rock, at the other stretch away plains smiling with the broad, honest brown under autumn sunlight. They are not quite lovable, even in distant tranquility of hue, and just escape being interesting in spite of their familiar rivers and associated belts of oaks. Nothing can ever render them quite charming, for in the startling splendor of flower-clad April, you're surfeited with an embarrassment of beauty, at all other times stunned by their poverty. Not so the summits. Forever new, full of individuality, rich in detail, and coloring themselves anew under every cloud change or hue of heaven, they lay you under their spell. From them, the eye comes back over granite waves and domes to the sharp precipice edges overhanging Yosemite. We look down those vast, hard granite fronts, cracked and splintered, scarred and stained, down over gorges crammed with debris or dark with files of climbing pines. Lower the precipice feet are wrapped in meadow and grove, and beyond, level and sunlit, lies the floor, that smooth, river-cut park with exquisite perfection of finish. The dome-like cap of Capitan is formed of concentric layers like the peels of an onion, each one about two or three feet thick. Upon the precipice itself, either from our station on an overhanging crevice or from any point of opposite cliff or valley bottom, this structure is seen to be superficial, never descending more than a hundred feet. In returning to camp, we followed a main ridge, smooth and white underfoot, but shaded by groves of alpine firs. Trees which here reach mature stature and in apparent health stand rooted in white gravel, resulting from surface decomposition. I'm sure their foliage is darker than can be accounted for by the effect of white contrasting earth. Wherever, in deep depressions, enough wash soil and vegetable mold have accumulated, there the trees gather in thicker groups, lift themselves higher, spread out more and finer feathered branches. Sometimes, however, richness of soil and perfection of condition prove fatal through overcrowding. They are wonderfully like human communities. One may trace in an hour's walk 
nearly all the laws which govern the physical life of men. Upon reaching camp, we found Longhurst in a deep religious calm, happy in his mind, happy too in the posture of his body, which was reclining at ease upon a comfortable blanket pile before the fire. A verse of the hymn Coronation escaped murmurously from his lips, rising at times in shaky crescendos, accompanied by a waving and desultory movement of the forefinger. He had found, among our medicines, a black bottle of brandy, contrived to induce a mule to break it, and, just to save as much as possible while it was leaking, drank with freedom. Anticipating any possible displeasure of ours, Longhurst had collected his wits and arrived at a most excellent dinner, crowning the repast with a duff, accurately globular, neatly brecciated, with abundant raisins, and drowned with a foaming sauce, to which the last of the brandy imparted an almost pathetic flavor. The evening closed with moral remark and spiritual song from Longhurst, and the morning introduced us to our prosaic labor of running the boundary line, a task which consumed several weeks and occupied nearly all of our days. I once or twice found time to go down to the cliff edges again for the purpose of making my geological studies. An excursion which Cotter and I made to the top of the three brothers proved of interest. A half hour's walk from camp, over rolling granite country, brought us to a ridge which jutted out boldly from the plateau to the edge of the Yosemite Wall. Upon the southern side of this eminence heads a broad, debris-filled ravine, which descends to the valley bottom. Upon the other side, the ridge sends down its waters along a steep declivity into a lovely mountain basin where, surrounded by forest, spreads out a level expanse of emerald meadow with a bit of blue lakelet in the midst. The outlet of this little valley is through a narrow rift in the rocks leading down into the Yosemite Fall. Along the crest of our jutting ridge, we found smooth pathway and soon reached the summit. Here again we were upon the verge of a precipice, this time 4,200 feet high. Beneath us, the whole upper half of the valley was as clearly seen as the southern half had been from Capitan. The sinuosities of the Merced, those narrow silvery gleams which indicated the channel of the Yosemite Creek, the broad expanse of meadow, and debris trains which had bounded down the sentinel slope were all laid out under us, though diminished by immense depth. The loftiest and most magnificent parts of the walls crowded in a semicircle in front of us. Above them, the domes, lifted even higher than ourselves, swept down to the precipice edges. Directly to our left, we overlooked the goblet-like recess into which the Yosemite tumbles, and could see the white torrent leap through its granite lip, disappearing a thousand feet below, hidden from our view by projecting crags, its roar floating up to us, now resounding loudly, and again dying off in faint reverberations like the sounding of the sea. Looking up upon the falls from the valley below, one utterly fails to realize the great depth of the semicircular alcove into which it descends. Looking back at El Capitan, its sharp vertical front was projected against far blue foothills, the creamy whiteness of sunlit granite cut upon aerial distance, clouds and cold blue sky shutting down over white crest and jetty pine plumes, which gather helmet-like upon its upper dome. Perspective effects are marvelously brought out by the stern, powerful reality of such rock bodies as Capitan. Across their terrible blade-like precipice edges, you look on and down over vistas of canyon and green high swells, the dark color of pine and fir broken by bare spots of harmonious red or brown, and changing with distance into purple, then blue 
which reaches on farther into the brown, monotonous plains. Beyond, where the earth's curve defines its horizon, dim serrations of coast range loom indistinctly on the hazy air. From here those remarkable fracture results, the royal arches, a series of recesses carved into the granite front, beneath the north dome, are seen in their true proportions. The concentric structure which covers the dome with a series of plates penetrates to a greater depth than usual. The arches themselves are only fractured edges of these plates, resulting from the intersection of a cliff plane with the conoidal shells. We had seen the Merced group of snow peaks heretofore from the west, but now gained a more oblique view, which began to bring out the thin obelisk form of Mount Clark, a shape of great interest from its marvelous thinness. Mount Star King, too, swelled up to its commanding height, the most elevated of the domes. Looking in the direction of Half Dome, I was constantly impressed with the inclination of the walls, with the fact that they are never vertical for any great depth. This is observed, too, remarkably in the case of El Capitan, whose apparently vertical profile is very slant, the actual base standing 1,200 feet in advance of the brow. For a week, the boundary survey was continued northeast and parallel to the cliff wall, about a mile back from its brink, following through forests and crossing granite spurs until we reached the summit of that high, bare chain which divides the Virgin's Tears from Yosemite Creek, and which, projecting southward, ends in the Three Brothers. East of this, the declivity falls so rapidly to the valley of the upper Yosemite Creek that chaining was impossible, and we were obliged to throw our line across the canyon a little over a mile by triangulation. This completed, we resumed it on the North Dome Spur, transferring our camp to a bit of alpine meadow south of the Mono Trail, but a short distance from the North Dome itself. After the line was finished here, and a system of triangles determined by which we connected our northern points with those across the chasm of the Yosemite, we made several geological excursions along the cliffs, studying the granite structure, working out its lithological changes, and devoting ourselves especially to the system of moraines and glacier marks which indicate direction and volume of the old ice flow. An excursion to the summit of the North Dome was exceedingly interesting. From the rear of our camp, we entered immediately a dense forest of conifers, which stretched southward along the summit of the ridge until solid granite, arresting erosion, afforded but little foothold. As usual among the cracks and clinging round the bases of boulders, a few hardy pines managed to live, almost to thrive, but as we walked, groups became scarcer, trees less healthy, all at last giving way to bare, solid stone. The North Dome itself, which is easily reached, affords an impressive view up the Illouette and across upon the fissured front of the Half Dome. It is also one of the most interesting specimens of conoidal structure, since its mass is not only divided by large spherical shells, but each of these is subdivided by a number of lesser divisional planes. No lithological change is, however, noticeable between the different shells. The granite is composed chiefly of orthoclase, transparent vitreous quartz, and about an equal proportion of black mica and hornblende. Here and there, adularia occurs, and very sparingly, albite. With no difficulty but some actual danger, I climbed down a smooth granite roof slope to where the precipice of royal arches makes off, and where, lying upon a sharp, neatly fractured edge, I was able to look down and study those purple markings which are vertically striped upon so many of these granite cliffs. I found them to be bands of lichen growth which follow the curves of occasional water flow. During any great rainstorm, 
and when snow upon the uplands is suddenly melted, innumerable streams, many of them of considerable volume, find their way to the precipice edge and pour down its front. Wherever this is the case, a deep purple lichen spreads itself upon the granite and forms those dark cloudings which add so greatly to the variety and interest of the cliffs. I found it extremest pleasure to lie there alone on the dizzy brink, studying the fine sculpture of cliff and crag, overlooking the arrangement of debris piles, and watching that slow, grand growth of afternoon shadows. Sunset found me there, still disinclined to stir, and repaid my laziness by a glorious spectacle of color. At this hour there is no more splendid contrast of light and shade than one sees upon the western gateway itself. Dark shadowed Capitan upon one side, profiled against the sunset sky, and the yellow mass of cathedral rocks rising opposite in full light, while the valley is divided equally between sunshine and shade. Pine groves and oaks, almost black in the shadow, are brightened up to clear red-browns where they pass out upon the lighted plain. The Merced, upon its mirror-like expanses, here reflects deep blue from Capitan, and there the warm cathedral gold. The last sunlight reflected from some curious smooth surfaces upon rocks east of the Sentinel and about a thousand feet above the valley. I at once suspected them to be glacier marks and booked them for further observation. My next excursion was up to Mount Hoffman, among a group of snow fields whose drainage gathers at last through lakes and brooklets to a single brook, the Yosemite, and flows twelve miles in a broad arc to its plunge over into the valley. From the summit, which is of a remarkably bedded conoidal mass of granite, sharply cut down in precipices fronting the north, is obtained a broad commanding view of the Sierras from afar, by the heads of several San Joaquin branches up to the ragged volcanic piles about Silver Mountain. From the top, I climbed along slopes and down by a wide detour among frozen snowbanks and many little basins of transparent blue water amid black shapes of stunted fir and over the confused wreck of rock and tree trunk thrown rudely in piles by avalanches whose tracks were fresh enough to be of interest. Upon reaching the bottom of a broad, open glacier valley, through whose middle flows the Yosemite Creek and its branches, I was surprised to find the streams nearly all dry, that the snow itself, under influence of cold, was a solid ice mass, and the Yosemite Creek, even after I had followed it down for miles, had entirely ceased to flow. At intervals, the course of the stream was carried over slopes of glacier-worn granite, ending almost uniformly in shallow rock basins, where were considerable ponds of water, in one or two instances expanding to the dignity of lakelets. The valley describes an arc whose convexity is in the main turned to the west, the stream running nearly due west for about four miles, turning gradually to the southward and having crossed the mono trail, bending again to the southeast, after which it discharges over the verge of the cliff. An average breadth of this valley is about half a mile. Its form, a shallow elliptical trough, rendered unusually smooth by the erosive action of old glaciers. roche montanay break its surface here and there, but in general the granite has been planed down into remarkable smoothness. All along its course, a varying rubbish of angular boulders has been left by the retiring ice, whose material, like that of the whole country, is of granite. But I recognized prominently black sinitic granite from the summit of Mount Hoffman, which from superior hardness has withstood disintegration and is perhaps the most frequent material of glacier blocks. The surface modeling is often of the most finished type, 
especially is this the case whenever the granite is highly silicious, its polish becoming then as brilliant as a marble mantle. In very feldspathic portions, and particularly where orthoclase predominates, the polished surface becomes a crust, usually about three-quarters of an inch thick, in which the ordinary appearance of the minerals has been somewhat changed, the rock surface by long pressure rendered extremely dense and in a measure separated from the underlying material. The smooth crust is constantly breaking off in broad flakes, the polishing extended up the valley sides to a height of about 700 feet. The average section of the old glacier was perhaps 600 feet thick by half a mile in width. I followed its whole course from Mount Hoffman down as far as I could ride, and then tying my horse only a little way from the brink of the cliff, I continued downward on foot, walking upon the dry stream bed, I found here and there a deep pit hole, sometimes twenty feet deep, was carved in mid-channel, and was often full of water. Just before reaching the cliff verge, the stream enters a narrow, sharp cut about 120 feet in depth, and probably not over 30 feet wide. The bottom and sides of this granite lip, here and there, are evidently glacier-polished, but the greater part of the scorings have been worn away by the attrition of sands, a peculiar brilliant polish, which may be seen there today, is wholly the result of recent sand friction. It was noon when I reached the actual lip and crept with extreme caution down over smooth rounded granite between towering walls to where the Yosemite Fall makes its wonderful leap. Polished rock curved over too dangerously for me to lean out and look down over the cliff front itself. A stone gate, dazzlingly gilded with sunlight, formed the frame through which I looked down upon that lovely valley. Contrast with the strength of yellow rock and severe adamantine sculpture threw over the landscape beyond a strange unreality a soft aerial depth of purple tone, quite as new to me as it was beautiful beyond description. There, 2,600 feet below, lay meadow and river, oak and pine, and a broad shadow zone cast by the opposite wall. Over it all, even though the dark sky overhead, there seemed to be poured some absolute color, some purple air, hiding details, and veiling with its soft, amethystine obscurity all that hard, broken roughness of the sentinel cliffs. In this strange, vacant stone corridor, this pathway for the great Yosemite torrent, this sounding gallery of thunderous tumult, it was a strange sensation to stand, looking in vain for a drop of water, listening vainly, too, for the faintest whisper of sound, and I found myself constantly expecting some sign of the returning flood. From the lip, I climbed a high point just to the east, getting a grand view down the cliff, where a broad purple band defined the Yosemite spray line. There, too, I found unmistakable ice striae, showing that the glacier of Mount Hoffman had actually poured over the brink. At the moments of such discovery, one cannot help restoring in imagination pictures of the past. When we stand by river bank or meadow of that fair valley, looking up at the torrent falling bright under fullness of light and lovely in its graceful wind-swayed airiness, we are apt to feel its enchantment. But how immeasurably grander must it have been when the great, living, moving glacier, with slow, invisible motion, crowded its huge body over the brink and launched blue ice blocks down through the foam of the cataract into that gulf of wild rocks and eddying mist. The one-eyed mule, Bonaparte, I found tied where I had left him, and as usual, I 
I approached him upon his blind side, able thus to get successfully into my saddle, without danger to life or limb. I could never become attached to the creature, although he carried me faithfully many difficult and some dangerous miles, and for the reason that he made a pretext of his half-blindness to commit excesses, such as crowding me against trees and refusing to follow trails. Realizing how terrible, under reinforcement of hereditary transmission, the peculiarly mulish traits would have become, one is more than thankful to nature for depriving this singular hybrid of the capacity of handing them down. Rather tired and not a little bruised by untimely collision with trees, I succeeded at last in navigating Bonaparte safely to camp and turning him over to his fellow, Pumpkin Seed. The nights were already cold, our beds on frozen ground, none of the most comfortable. In fact, enthusiasm had quite as much to do with our content as the blankets or Longhurst culinary art, which, enclosed now by the narrow limit of bacon, bread, and beans, failed to produce such dainties as thrice-turned slapjacks or plum duffs of solemnizing memory. One more geological trip finished my examination of this side of the Great Valley. It was a two-days ramble all over the granite ridges, from the North Dome up to Lake Tenea, during which I gathered ample evidence that a broad sheet of glacier, partly derived from Mount Hoffman, and in part from the Mount Watkins Ridge and Cathedral Peak, but mainly from the great Ptolemnate Glacier, gathered and flowed down into the Yosemite Valley. Where it moved over the cliffs, there are well-preserved scarrings. The facts which attest to this are open to observation and seem to me important in making up a statement of past conditions. We were glad to get back at last to our two little cabins in the valley, although our serio-comic hangers-on, the diggers, were gone, and the great fall was dry. A rest of one day proved refreshing enough for us to leave camp and ascend by Mariposa Trail to Meadow Brook, where we made a bivouac from which Gardner began his southern boundary line, and I renewed my geological studies east of Inspiration Point. I always go swiftly by this famous point of view now, feeling somehow that I don't belong to that army of literary travelers who have here planted themselves and burst into rhetoric. Here all who make California books, down to the last and most sentimental specimen who so much as meditates a letter to his or her local paper, they dismount and inflate. If those furs could recite half the droll mo they have listened to, or if I dared tell half the delicious points I treasure, it would sound altogether too amusing among these dry enough chapters. I had always felt a desire to examine Bridal Vale Canyon and the southwest cathedral slope. Accordingly, one fine morning I set out alone and descended through chaparral and over rough debris slopes to the stream, which at this time, unlike other upland brooks, flowed freely, though with far less volume than in summer. At this altitude, only such streams as derive their volume wholly from melting snow dry up in the cold autumnal and winter months. Spring-fed brooks hold their own, and rather increase as cold weather advances. It was a wild gorge down which I tramped, following the stream bed often jumping from block to block or letting myself down by the chaparral boughs that overhung my way. Splendid walls on either side rose steep and high, for the most part bare, but here and there on shelf or crevice bearing clusters of fine conifers, their lower slopes one vast wreck of boulders and thicket of chaparral plants. Not without some difficulty, I at length got to the brink and sat down to rest, looking over at the valley, whose meadows were only a thousand feet below. A cool, stirring breeze blew up the Merced Canyon, swinging the lace-like scarf of foam which fell from my feet and, floating now against the purple cliff, again blew out gracefully to the right or left, 
While I looked, a gust came roaming around the cathedral rocks, impinging against our cliff near the fall, and apparently got in between it and the cliff, carrying the whole column of falling water straight out in a streamer through the air. I went back to the camp by way of the cathedral rocks, finding much of interest in the conoidal structure, which is yet perfectly apparent and unobscured by erosion or the terrible splitting asunder they have suffered. Upon a ridge connecting these rocks with the plateaus just south, there were many instructive and delightful points of view, especially the crag just above the cathedral spires, from which I overlooked a large part of the valley and cliff, with the two sharp slender minarets of granite close beneath me. That great block forming the plateau between the Yosemite and Illouette canyons afforded a fine field for studying granite, pine, and many remarkable characteristic views of the gorge below and peaks beyond. From our camp, I explored every ravine and climbed each eminence, reaching at last one fine afternoon the top of that singular hemispherical mass, the Sentinel Dome. From this point, one sweeps the horizon in all directions. You stand upon the crest of half a globe, whose smooth white sides, bearing here and there stunted pines, slope away regularly in all directions from your feet. Below granite masses, blackened here and there with densely clustered forest, stretch through varied undulations toward you. At a little distance from the foot of Half Dome, trees held upon sharp brinks and precipices plunge off into Yosemite upon one side, and the dark rocky canyon of Illouette upon the other. Eastward, soaring into clouds, stands the thin vertical mass of the half dome. From this view, the snowy peak of the obelisk, flattened into broad dome-like outline, rises, shutting out the more distant Sierra summits. This peak, from its peculiar position and thin tower-like form, offers one of the most tempting summits of the region. From that slender top, one might look into the Yosemite and into that basin of ice and granite between the Merced and Mount Lyell groups. I had longed for it through the last month's campaign and now made up my mind, with this inspiring view, to attempt it at all hazards. A little way to the east, and about a thousand feet below the brink of the glacier point, the crags appeared to me particularly tempting. So, in the late afternoon I descended, walking over a rough, gritty surface of granite, which gave me secure foothold. Upon the very edge the immense splintered blocks lay piled one upon another, here a mass jutting out and overhanging upon the edge, and here a huge slab pointed out like a barbette gun. I crawled out upon one of these projecting blocks and rested myself while studying the view. From here the one very remarkable object is the half dome. You see it now edgewise and in sharp profile, the upper half of the conoidal fronting the north with a sharp, sheer fracture face of about 2,000 feet vertical. From the top of this, a most graceful helmet curve sweeps over to the south and descends almost perpendicularly into the valley of the Little Yosemite. And here from the foot springs up the block of Mount Broderick, a single rough-hewn pyramid, 3,000 feet from summit to base, trimmed upon its crest with a few pines and spreading out its southern base into a precipice over which plunges the white Nevada torrent. Observation had taught me that a glacier flowed over the Yosemite brink. As I looked over now, I could see its shallow valley, and the ever-rounded rocks over which it crowded itself and tumbled into the icy valley below. Up the Yosemite Gorge, which opened straight before me, I knew that another great glacier had flowed, and also that the valley of the Illouette and the little Yosemite had been the bed of rivers of ice. 
a study too of the markings upon the glacier cliff above hutchings house had convinced me that a glacier no less than a thousand feet deep had flowed through the valley occupying its entire bottom it was impossible for me as i sat perched upon this jutting rock mass in full view of all the canyons which had led into this wonderful converging system of ice rivers not to imagine a picture of the glacier period bare or snow-laden cliffs overhung the gulf streams of ice here smooth and compacted into a white plain there riven into innumerable crevices or tossed into forms like the waves of a tempest-lashed sea crawled through all the gorges torrents of water and avalanches of rock and snow spouted at intervals all along the cliff walls not a tree nor a vestige of life was in sight except far away upon ridges below or out upon the dimly expanding plain granite and ice and snow silence broken only by the howling tempest and the crash of falling ice or splintered rock and a sky deep freighted with cloud and storm these were the elements of a period which lasted immeasurably long and only in comparatively the most recent geological times have given way to the present marvelously changed condition nature in her present aspects as well as in the records of her past here constantly offers the most vivid and terrible contrasts can anything be more wonderfully opposite than that period of leaden sky, gray granite, and desolate stretches of white, and the present, when of the old order we have only left the solid framework of granite and the indelible inscriptions of glacier work. Today their burnished pathways are legibly traced with the history of the past. Every ice stream is represented by a feeble river. Every great glacier cascade by a torrent of white foam dashing itself down rugged walls or spouting from the brinks of upright cliffs the very avalanche tracks are darkened by clustered woods and over the level pathway of the great yosemite glacier itself is spread a park of green a mosaic of forest a thread of river end of chapter seven around Yosemite walls. Chapter 8 of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8. A Sierra Storm. From every commanding eminence around the Yosemite, no distant object rises with more inspiring greatness than the obelisk of Mount Clark. Seen from the west, it is a high, isolated peak, having a dome-like outline very much flattened upon its west side, the precipice sinking deeply down to an old glacier ravine. From the north, this peak is a slender, single needle, jutting 2,000 feet from a rough-hewn pedestal of rocks and snowfields. Forest-covered heights rise to its base from east and west. To the south, it falls into a deep saddle, which rises again after a level outline of a mile, sweeping up in another noble granite peak. On the north, the spur drops abruptly down, overhanging an edge of the great Merced Gorge, its base buried beneath an accumulation of morainal matter deposited by ancient Merced glaciers. From the region of Mount Hoffman, looming in most impressive isolation, its slender needle-like summit had long fired us with ambition, and having finished my agreeable climb round the Yosemite walls, I concluded to visit the mountain with Cotter, and, if the weather should permit, to attempt to climb. We packed our two mules with the week's provisions, and a single blanket each, and on the 10th of November left our friends at the headquarters camp in Yosemite Valley and rode out upon the Mariposa Trail, reaching the plateau by noon. 
Having passed Meadow Brook, we left the path and bore off in the direction of Mount Clark, spending the afternoon in riding over granite ridges and open stretches of frozen meadow where the ground was all hard and grass entirely cropped off by numerous herds of sheep that had ranged here during the summer. The whole earth was bare and rang under our mule's hoofs almost as clearly as the granite itself. We camped for the night on one of the most eastern affluents of Bridal Vale Creek and were careful to fill our canteens before the bitter night chill should freeze it over. By our camp was a pile of pine logs swept together by some former tempest. We lighted them and were quickly saluted by a magnificent bonfire. The animals were tied within its ring of warmth and our beds laid where the rain of sparks could not reach. As we were just going to sleep, our mules pricked up their ears and looked into the forest. We sprang to our feet, picked up our pistols, expecting an Indian or a grizzly, but were surprised to see, riding out of the darkness, a lonely mountaineer, mounted upon a little mustang, carrying his long rifle across the saddle-bow. He came directly to our campfire and, without uttering a word, slowly and with great effort, swung himself out of his saddle and walked close to the flames, leaving his horse, who remained motionless, where he had reined him in. I saw that the man was nearly frozen to death and immediately threw my blanket over his shoulders. The water in our camp kettle was still hot and Cotter made haste to draw a pot of tea while I broiled a slice of beef and pressed him to eat it. He, however, shook his head and maintained a persistent silence, until at length, after turning round and round, until I would have thought him done to a turn, in a very feeble, broken voice, he ejaculated, I was pretty near gone in, stranger. Again I pressed him to drink a cup of tea, but he feebly answered, Not yet. After roasting for half an hour, in which I fully expected to see his coat-tail smoke, he sat down and drank about two quarts of tea. This had the effect of thawing him out, and he remembered that his horse was still saddled and very hungry. He told us that neither he nor the animal had had anything to eat for three days, and that he was pushing hopelessly westward, expecting either the giving out of his horse or death by freezing. We took the saddle from his tired little mustang, spread the saddle blanket over his back, and from the scanty supply of grain we had brought for our own animals, gave him a tolerable supper. It's wonderful how in hours of danger and privation the horse clings to his human friend. Perfectly tame, perfectly trusting, he throws the responsibility of his care and life upon his rider, and it is not the least pathetic among our mountain experiences to see this patient confidence continue until death. Observing that the logs were likely to burn freely all night, we divided our blankets with the mountaineer, and Cotter and I turned in together. In the morning, our new friend had entirely recovered from his numb, stupid condition. Recognizing at a glance his whereabouts, and thanking us feelingly for our rough hospitality, he herded toward the Mariposa Trail, with quite an affecting good-bye. After breakfast, we ourselves mounted and rode up a long forest-covered spur leading to the summit of a granite divide, which we crossed at a narrow pass between two abrupt cliffs and ascended its eastern slope in full view of the whole Merced group. This long abrupt descent in front of us led to the Illouette Creek and directly opposite on the other side of the trough-like valley rose the high, sharp summit of Mount Clark. We were all day in crossing and riding up the crest of a sharply curved medial moraine which traced itself from the mountain south of Mount Clark in a long parabolic curve, dying out at last in the bottom of the Illouette Basin. The moraine was one of the most perfect I have ever seen, its smooth, graded summit rose as regularly as a railway embankment and seemed to be formed altogether of irregular boulders piled securely together and cemented by a thick deposit 
of granitic glacier dust. Late in the afternoon we had reached its head, where the two converging glaciers of Mount Clark and Mount Kyle had joined, clasping a rugged promontory of granite. To our left, in a depression of the forest-covered basin, lay a little patch of meadow wholly surrounded by dense clumps of alpine trees, which grew in clusters of five and six, apparently from one root. A little stream from the obelisk's snows fell in a series of shallow cascades by the meadow's margin. We jumped across the brook and went into camp, tethering the mules close by us. One of the great charms of high mountain camps is their very domestic nature. Your animals are picketed close by the kitchen, your beds are between the two, and the water and the wood are always in most comfortable apposition. For the first time in many months, a mild, moist wind sprang up from the south, and with it came slowly creeping over the sky a dull, leaden bank of ominous-looking cloud. Since April, we had had no storm. The perpetually cloudless sky had banished all thought, almost memory, of foul weather, but winter tempests had already held off remarkably, and we knew that at any moment they might set in, and in twenty-four hours render the plateaus impassable. It was with some anxiety that I closed my eyes that night, and, sleeping lightly, often woke as a freshening wind moved the pines. At dawn we were up, and observed that a dark, heavy mass of storm cloud covered the whole sky, and had settled down over the obelisk, wrapping even the snowfields at its base in gray folds. The entire peak was lost, except now and then, when the torn vapors parted for a few moments and disclosed its sharp summit, whitened by new-fallen snow. A strange moan filled the air. The winds howled pitilessly over the rocks and swept in deafening blasts through the pines. It was my duty to saddle up directly and flee for the Yosemite, but I am naturally an optimist, a sort of geological macabre, so... I dodged my duty, and determined to give the weather every opportunity for a clear-off. Accordingly, we remained in camp all day, studying the minerals of the granite as the thickly strewn boulders gave us material. At nightfall I climbed a little rise back of our meadow and looked out over the basin of the Illouette and up in the direction of the obelisk. Now and then the parting clouds opened a glimpse of the mountain and occasionally an unusual blast of wind blew away the deeply settled vapors from the canyon to westward, but each time they closed in more threateningly, and before I descended to camp the whole land was obscured in the cloud which settled densely down. The mules had made themselves comfortable with the repast of rich mountain grasses which, though slightly frosted, still retained much of their original juice and nutriment. We ourselves made a deep inroad on the supply of provisions, and, after chatting a while by the firelight, went to bed, taking the precaution to pile our effects carefully together, covering them with an India rubber blanket. Our bivouac was in the middle of a cluster of firs, quite well protected overhead, but open to the sudden gusts, which blew roughly hither and thither. By nine o'clock, wind died away altogether, and in a few moments, a thick cloud of snow was falling. We had gone to bed together, pulled the blankets as a cover over our heads, and in a few moments fell into a heavy sleep. Once or twice in the night, I woke with a slight sense of suffocation and cautiously lifted the blanket over my head, but each time found it growing heavier and heavier with a freight of snow. In the morning, we awoke quite early and, pushing back the blanket, found that we had been covered by about a foot and a half of snow. The poor mules had approached us to the limit of their rope and stood within a few feet of our beds, anxiously waiting our first signs of life. We hurried to breakfast, and hastily putting on the saddles and wrapping ourselves from head to foot in our blankets, mounted, and 
and started for the crest of the moraine. I had taken the precaution to make a little sketch map in my notebook with the compass directions of our march from the Yosemite, and we now had the difficult task of retracing our steps in a storm so blinding and fierce that we could never see more than a rod in advance. But for the regular form of the moraine, with whose curve we were already familiar, I fear we must have lost our way in the real labyrinth of glaciated rocks which covered the whole Illouette Basin. Snow blew in every direction, filling our eyes and blinding the poor mules, who often turned quickly from some sudden gust and refused to go on. It was a cruel necessity, but we spurred them inexorably forward, guiding them to the right and left to avoid rocks and trees, which, in their blindness, they were constantly threatening to strike. Warmly rolled in our blankets, we suffered little from cold, but the driving sleet and hail very soon bruised our cheeks and eyelids most painfully. It required real effort of will to face the storm, and we very soon learned to take turns in breaking trail. The snow constantly balled upon our animals' feet, and they slid in every direction. Now and then, in descending a sharp slope of granite, the poor creatures would get sliding and rush to the bottom, their legs stiffened out and their heads thrust forward in fear. After crossing the Illouette, which we did at our old ford, we found it very difficult to climb the long, steep hillside, for the mules were quite unable to carry us, obliging us to lead them and to throw ourselves upon the snowdrifts to break a pathway. This slope almost wore us out, and when at last we reached its summit, we threw ourselves upon the snow for a rest, but were in such a profuse perspiration that I deemed it unsafe to lie there for a moment, and, getting up again, we mounted the mules and rode slowly on toward open plateaus near great meadows. The snow gradually decreased in depth as we descended upon the plain directly south of the Yosemite. The wind abated somewhat, and there were only occasional snow flurries between half hours of tolerable comfort. Constant use of the compass and reference to my little map at length brought us to the Mariposa Trail, but not until after eight hours of anxious, exhaustive labor. Anxious from the constant dread of losing our way in the blinding confusion of storm, exhausting, for we had more than half of the way acted as trail breakers, dragging her frightened and tired brutes after us. The poor creatures instantly recognized the trail and started in a brisk trot toward Inspiration Point. Suddenly, an icy wind swept up the valley, carrying with it a storm of snow and hail. The wind blew with such violence that the whole freight of sleet and ice was carried horizontally with fearful swiftness, cutting the bruised faces of the mules and giving our own eyelids exquisite torture. The brutes refused to carry us farther. We were obliged to dismount and drive them before us, beating them constantly with clubs. Fighting our way against this bitter blast, half-blinded by hard, wind-driven snow crystals, we at last gave up and took refuge in a dense clump of firs which crowned the spur by Inspiration Point. Our poor mules cowered under shelter with us and turned tail to the storm. The fir trees were solid cones of snow, which now and then unloaded themselves when severely bent by a sudden gust, half burying us in dry white powder. Wind roared below us in the Yosemite Gorge. It blew from the west, rolling up in waves which smote the cliffs and surged on up the valley. While we sat still, the drifts began to pile up at our backs. The mules were belly deep, and our situation began to be serious. Looking over the cliff brink, we saw but the hurrying snow and only heard a confused tumult of wind. A steady increase in the severity of the gale made us fear that the trees might crash down over us, so we left the mules and crept cautiously over the edge of the cliff and ensconced ourselves in a sheltered nook. 
protected by walls of rock which rose at our back. We were on the brink of the Yosemite, and but for snow might have looked down three thousand feet. The storm eddied below us, sucking down whirlwinds of snow, and sometimes opening deep rifts, never enough, however, to disclose more than a few hundred feet of cliffs. We had been in this position about an hour, half frozen and soaked through, when I at length gathered conscience enough to climb back and take a look at our brutes. The forlorn pair were frosted over with a thick coating, their pitiful eyes staring eagerly at me. I had half a mind to turn them loose, but considering that their obstinate nature might lead them back to our obelisk camp, I patted their noses and climbed back to the shelf by Cotter, determined to try it for a quarter of an hour more, when, if the tempest did not lull, I thought we must press on and face the snow for an hour more while we tramped down to the valley. Suddenly there came a lull in the storm. Its blinding fury of snow and wind ceased. Overhead, still hurrying eastward, the white bank drove on, unveiling as it fled, the Yosemite walls, plateau, and every object to the eastward as far as Mount Clark. As yet the valley bottom was obscured by a laver of mist and cloud, which rose to the height of about a thousand feet, submerging cliff foot and debris pile. Between these strata, the cloud above and the cloud below, every object was in clear, distinct view. The sharp, terrible fronts of precipices, capped with a fresh cover of white, plunged down into the still gray river of cloud below. Their stony surfaces, clouded with purple and salmon color and the bandings of brown, all hues unnoticeable in everyday lights. Forest and crag and plateau and distant mountain were snow-covered to a uniform whiteness. Only the dark gorge beneath us showed the least traces of color. There all was rich, deep, gloomy. Even over the snowy surfaces above there prevailed an almost ashen gray, which reflected itself from the dull drifting sky. A few torn locks of vapor poured over the cliff edge at intervals and crawled down like wreaths of smoke, floating gracefully and losing themselves at last in the bank of cloud which lay upon the bottom of the valley. On a sudden the whole gray roof rolled away like a scroll, leaving the heavens from west to far east one expanse of pure warm blue. Setting sunlight smote full upon the stony walls below and shot over the plateau country, gilding here a snowy forest group and there a wave crest of whitened ridge. The whole air sparkled with diamond particles. Red light streamed in through the open Yosemite gateway, brightening those vast solemn faces of stone and intensifying the deep neutral blue of shadowed alcoves. The luminous cloud bank in the east rolled from the last Sierra crest, leaving the whole chain of peaks in broad light, each rocky crest strongly red, the newly fallen snow marbling them over with the soft deep rose, and wherever a canyon carved itself down their rocky fronts, its course was traceable by a shadowy band of blue. The middle distance glowed with a tint of golden yellow, the broken heights along the canyon brinks and edges of the cliff in front were of an intense spotless white. Far below us, the cloud stratum melted away, revealing the floor of the valley, whose russet and emerald and brown and red burned in the broad evening sun. It was a marvelous piece of contrasted lights, the distance so pure, so soft in its rosy warmth, so cool in the depth of its shadowy blue, the foreground, strong and fiery orange or sparkling in absolute whiteness. I enjoyed, too, looking up at the pure, unclouded sky, which now wore an aspect of intense serenity. For half an hour, 
nature seemed in entire repose. Not a breath of wind stirred the white, snow-laden shafts of the trees, not a sound of animate creature or the most distant reverberation of waterfall reached us. No film of vapor moved across the tranquil sapphire sky. Absolute quiet reigned until a loud roar proceeding from Capitan turned our eyes in that direction. From the round, dome-like cap of its summit, there moved down an avalanche, gathering volume and swiftness as it rushed to the brink and then, leaping out two or three hundred feet into space, fell, slowly filtering down through the lighted air like a silver cloud until within a thousand feet of the earth it floated into the shadow of the cliff and sank to the ground as a faint blue mist. Next, the cathedral snow poured from its lighted summit in resounding avalanches. Then the three brothers shot off their loads, and afar from the east a deep roar reached us as the whole snow cover thundered down the flank of Cloud's Rest. We were warned by the hour to make all haste, and driving the poor brutes before us, made our way down the trail as fast as possible. The light, already pale, left the distant heights in still more glorious contrast. A zone of amber sky rose behind the glowing peaks, and a cold steel-blue plain of snow skirted their bases. Mist slowly gathered again in the gorge below us and overspread the valley floor, shutting it out from our view. We ran down the zigzag trail until we came to that shelf of bare granite immediately below the final descent into the valley. Here we paused, just above the surface of the clouds, which, swept by fitful breezes, rose in swells floating up and sinking again like waves of the sea. Intense light, more glowing than ever, streamed in upon the upper half of the cliffs, their bases sunken in the purple mist. As the cloud waves crawled upward in the breeze, they here and there touched a red-purple light and fell back again into the shadow. We watched these effects with greatest interest, and just as we were about moving on again, a loud burst as of heavy thunder arrested us, sounding as if the very walls were crashing in. We looked, and from the whole brow of Capitan rushed over one huge avalanche, breaking into the finest powder and floating down through orange light, disappearing in the sea of purple cloud beneath us. We soon mounted and pressed up the valley to our camp, where our anxious friends greeted us with enthusiastic welcome and never-to-be-forgotten beans. We fed our exhausted animals a full ration of barley and turned them out to shelter themselves as best they might under friendly oaks or among young pines. In anticipation of our return, the party had gotten up a capital supper, to which we first administered justice, then punishment, and finally annihilation. Brief starvation and a healthy combat for life with the elements lent a most marvelous zest to the appetite, under the subtle influences of a free circulation and a stinging cold night, I perceived a region of the taste which answers to those most refined blue waves of the spectrum. Clouds which had enfolded the heavens rolled off to the east in torn fillets of gold. The stars came out full and flashing in the darkling sky of evening. We left our cabins and grouped ourselves around a loquacious campfire, which prattled incessantly and distilled volumes of that mild stimulant, pyroligneous acid, an ill-savored gas which seems to have inspired much domestic poetry, however it may have affected the New England olfactory nerves. The vast valley walls, light in contrast with the deep nocturnal violet heavens, rose far into the night, apparently holding up a roof of stars, whose brilliancy faded quite rapidly, until finally the last blinking points of light died out, and cold, hard gray stretched from cliff to cliff. 
far up canyons and in the heart of the mountains, we could hear terrible tempest gusts crashing among the trees and breaking in deep, long surges against faces of granite. Coming nearer and nearer, they swept down the gorges with volume increasing every moment until they poured into the upper end of the valley and fell upon its groves with terrible fury. The wind shrieked wild and high among the summit crags. It tore through the pine belts, and now and then a sudden sharp crash resounded through the valley as one after another old and firm pines were hurled down before its blast. The very walls seemed to tremble. The air was thick with flying leaves and dead branches. The snow of the summits, hard frozen by a sudden chill, was blown from the walls and filled the air with its keen cutting crystals. At last the very clouds, torn into wild flocks, were swept down into the valley, filling it with opaque, hurrying vapors. Rocks loosening themselves from the plateau came thundering down precipice faces, crashing upon debris piles and forest groups below. Sleet and snow and rain fell fast, and the boom of falling trees and crashing avalanches followed one another in an almost uninterrupted roar. In the Sentinel Gorge, back of our camp, an avalanche of rock suddenly let loose and came down with a harsh rattle, the boulders bounding over debris piles and crashing through the trees by our camp. A vivid belt of blue lightning flashed down through the blackness, and for a moment every outline of cliff and forest forms, the rushing clouds of snow and sleet, were lighted up with a cold, pallid gleam. The burst of thunder which followed rolled but for a moment and was silenced by the furious storm. In the moment of lightning I saw that the Yosemite Fall, which had been dry for a month, had suddenly sprung into life again. Vast volumes of water and ice were pouring over and beating like sea waves upon the granite below. Our mules came up to the cabin and stood on its lee side trembling and uttering suppressed moans. After hours, the fitfulness of the tempest passed away, leaving a grand, monotonous roar. It had torn off all the rotten branches of the year and prostrated every decrepit tree and at last settled down to a continuous gale, laden with torrents of rain. We laid down upon our bunks and our clothes, watching and listening through all the first hours of the night. Sleep was impossible. Angry winds and the fury of drifting rain shook our little shelters and kept us wide awake. Toward morning, a second thunderstorm burst, and by the light of its flashes I saw that the river had risen nearly to our cabin door, covering the broad valley in front of us with a sheet of flood. Gradually, the sound of Yosemite Fall grew louder and stronger. The throbs, as it beat upon the rocks, rising higher and higher till the whole valley rung with its pulsations. By dawn, the storm had spent its fury. Rain ceased, and around us the air was perfectly still. But aloft, among cliffs and walls, it might still be heard sweeping across the forest and tearing itself among granite needles. Fearing that so continuous a storm might block up our mountain trails, Hyde and Cotter and Wilmer, with instruments and pack animals, started early and went out to Clark's ranch. So dense and impenetrable a fog overhung us that daylight came with extreme slowness, and it was nine o'clock before we rose for breakfast, and at ten a gloomy sea of mist still hung over the valley. The Merced had overflowed its banks and ran wild. Toward noon, the mist began to draw down the valley, and finally all drifted away, leaving us shut in by a gray canopy of cloud which stretched from wall to wall, hanging down here and there in deep blue sags. In this stratum of gray were lost many higher summits, but the whole form of the valley and cliff could be seen with terrible distinctness, the walls apparently drawn together together, 
their bases at one or two points pushed into yellow floods of water which lay like lakes upon the level expanse. The whole lip of Yosemite was filled to the brim, and through it there poured a broad torrent of white. Shortly after noon, a few rifts opened overhead, showing a far sky, from which poured gushes of strong yellow sunlight, touching here and there upon the somber faces of cliff, and occasionally gilding the falling torrent. A wind still blew, smiting the Yosemite precipice, and playing strangest games with the fall itself. At one time, a gust rushed upon the lip of the fall with such violence as to dam back all its waters. We could see its white pile in the lip mounting higher and higher, still held back by the wind, until there must have been a front of from 150 to 200 feet of boiling white water. For a whole minute, not a drop poured down the wall. But gathering strength, the torrent overcame the wind, rushed out with tremendous violence, leaped 150 feet straight out into the air, and fell clear to the rocks below, dashing high and white again, and breaking into a cloud of spray that filled the lower air of the valley for a mile. While the water was held back in the gorge, there was a moment of complete silence, but when it finally burst out again, a crash as of sudden thunder shook the air. At times, gusts of wind would drive upon the Three Brothers Cliff and be deflected toward the Yosemite, swinging the whole mighty cataract like a pendulum, and again pouring upon the rocks at the bottom of the valley, it would gather up the whole fall in midair, whirl it in a festoon, and carry it back over the very summit of the walls. I got out the theodolite to measure the angle of its deflection, and while watching, it swung over an entire semicircle, now carried from the cliffs to the right, and then whirled back in a cloud of foam over the head of the three brothers. A very frequent prank was to loop the whole 2,600 feet of cataract into a single semicircular festoon, which fell in the form of fine fringe. Throughout the afternoon, we did little else than watch these ever-changing forms of falling water until toward evening when we walked up to see them or said, I never beheld such a rapid rise in any river. From a mere brook, hiding itself away under overhanging banks and among shrubby islands, it sprang in one night to the size of a full large river, flowing with the rapidity of a torrent and whirling in its eddies huge trunks of storm-blown pines. As twilight gathered, the scene deepened into a most indescribable gloom. Dark blue shadows covered half the precipices, and sullen, unvaried sky stretched over us its implacable gray. There was something positively fearful in this color. Such an impenetrable sky might overarch the inferno. As we looked, it slowly sank, creeping down precipices, filling the whole gorge, coming down, down, and fitting the cliffs like the piston of an air pump, till within a thousand feet of us it became stationary and then slowly lifted again, clearing the summit and rising to an almost infinite remoteness. Slowly, a few hard, sharp crystals of snow floated down. Later, the air became intensely chilly and by dark was full of slowly falling snow, giving prospect of a great mountain storm which might close the Sierras. On the following morning, we determined at all costs to pack our remaining instruments and escape. The ground was covered with snow to the depth of seven or eight inches, and through drifting fog banks we could occasionally get glimpses and see that every cliff was deeply buried in snow. We still had a few barometrical observations along the Mariposa Trail which were necessary to complete our series of altitudes, and I started in advance of Gardner and Clark to break the trail, expecting that when I stopped to make readings, 
they would easily overtake me. Two hours' hard work was needed to reach the ascent. It was not until noon that I made inspiration point, snow having deepened to eighteen inches, entirely obliterating the trail, and had it not been for the extreme frequency of our journeys, I should never have been able to follow it. As it was, with occasional mistakes, which were soon remedied, I kept the way very well, and my tracks made it easy for the party behind. Having reached the plateau, I made my two barometrical stations, and then started alone through forests for West Falls Cabin. Every fir tree was a solid cone of white. Often clusters of five or six were buried together in one common pile. Now and then a little sunlight broke through the clouds, and in these intervals the scene was one of wonderful beauty. Tall shafts of fir, often 180 feet high, trimmed with white branches, cast their blue shadows upon snowy ground. At about four o'clock, after nine hours of hard tramping, I reached Westfall's cabin, built a fire, and sat down to warm myself and wait for my friends. In half an hour they made their appearance, looking haggard and weary, declaring they would go no further that night. They led their mule into the cabin, and unpacked, and began to make themselves comfortably at home. About five the darkness of night had fairly settled down, and with it came a gentle but dense snowstorm. It seemed to me a terrible risk for us to remain in the mountains, and I felt it to be absolutely necessary that one, at least, should press on to Clark's, so that if a really great storm should come, he could bring up aid. Accordingly, I volunteered to go on myself, Clark and Gardner expressing their determination to remain where they were at all costs. At this juncture, Cotter's well-known voice sounded through the woods as he approached the cabin. He had been all day climbing from Clark's and had come to lend a hand in getting the things down. He was of my opinion that it was absolutely necessary for one of us, at least, to go back to Clark's and offered, if I thought best, to try to accompany me. I had come from Yosemite and he from Clark's, having traveled all day, and it was no slight task for us to face storm and darkness in the forest and among complicated spurs of the Sierra. We ate our lunch by the cabin fire, bade our friends good night, and walked out together into the darkness. For the first mile, there was no danger of missing our way. Even in the darkness of night, Cotter's tracks could be seen. But after about half an hour, it began to be very difficult to keep the trail. The storm increased to a tempest, and exhaustion compelled us to travel slower and slower. It was with intense anxiety that we searched for well-known blazed trees along the trail, often thrusting our arms down in the snow to feel for a blaze that we knew of. If it was not there, we had... For a moment, an overpowering sense of being lost. But we were ordinarily rewarded after searching upon a few trees, and the blaze, once found, reanimated us with new courage. Hour after hour, we traveled down the mountain, falling off high banks now and then, for in the dark all ideas of slope were lost. It must have been about midnight when we reached what seemed to be the verge of a precipice, if our calculations were right, we must have reached the edge of South Fork Canyon. Here Cotter sank with exhaustion and declared that he must sleep. I rolled him over and implored him to get up and struggle on for a little while longer, when I felt sure that we must get down to South Fork Canyon. He utterly refused and lay there in a drowsy condition, fast giving up to the effects of fatigue and cold. I unbound a long scarf which was tied around his neck, put it under his arms like a harness, and, tying it round my body, started on, dragging him through the snow to see if by that means I might not exasperate him to rise and labor on. In a few minutes it had its effect, 
and he sprang to his feet and fell upon me in a burst of indignation. A few words were enough to bring him to himself, and when the old calm courage was reasserted, and we started together to make our way down the cliff. Happily, we at length found the right ridge and rapidly descended through forest to the riverside. Believing that we must still be below the bridge, we walked rapidly up the bank until, at last, we found it and came quickly to Clark's. We pounded upon the cabin door and waked up our friends, who received us with joy and set about cooking us a supper. It was two o'clock when we arrived, and by three we all went off again to our bunks. My anxiety about Gardner and Clark prevented my sleeping. Every few minutes I went to the door. Before dawn it had cleared again, and remained fair until the next noon, when the two made their appearance. No sooner were they quietly housed that the storm burst again with renewed strength, howling among the forest trees grandly. Snow drifted heavily all the afternoon, and through the night it still fell, reaching an average depth of about two feet by the following morning. We were up early and packed upon the animals our instruments, notebooks, and personal effects, leaving all the blankets and heavy baggage to be gotten out in the following spring. We toiled slowly and heavily up Chowchilla Trail. The branches of the great pines and firs were overloaded with snow, which now and then fell in small avalanches upon our heads. Here and there an old bough gave way under its weight, and fell with the soft thud into the snow. We took turns breaking trail. Napoleon, the one-eyed mule, distinguishing himself greatly by following its intricate crooks, while the bravest of us, by turns, held to his tail. There is something deeply humiliating in this process. All the domineering qualities of mankind vanished before the quick, subtle instinct of that noble animal, the mule, and his superior strength came out in magnificent style. With a sublime scorn of his former master, he started ahead, dragging me proudly after him. I had sometimes thrashed that mule with unsympathetic violence, and I fancied it was something very like poetic justice thus submissively to follow in his wake. Midday found us upon the Chowchilla summit, following a trail deeply buried and often obliterated, and undiscoverable but for our long-eared leader. As we descended the west slope, the snow grew more and more moist, less deep, and gradually turned into rain. An hour's tramp found us upon bare ground, under the fiercely driving rain which quickly soaked us to the bone. The streams as we descended were found to be more and more swollen, until at last it required some nerve to ford the little brooklets, which the mule had drunk dry on our upward journey. The earth was thoroughly softened, and here and there the trail was filled with brimming brooks which rapidly gullied it out. A more drowned and bedraggled set of fellows never walked out upon the ragged road and turned toward Mariposa. Streams of water flowed from every fold of our garments. Our soaked hats clung to our cheeks. The baggage was a mass of pulp, and the mules smelled violently of wet hide. Fortunately, our notebooks, carefully strapped in oilcloth, so far resisted wetting. It was three o'clock in the afternoon when we reached Dulong's house, and were surprised to see the water flowing over the top of the bridge. In ordinary times, a dry arroyo traverses this farm and runs under a bridge in front of the house. Clark, our only mounted man, rode out, as he supposed, upon the bridge, but unfortunately it was gone, and he and his horse plunged splendidly into the stream. They came to the surface, Clark with a look of intense astonishment on his face, and the mare sputtering and striking out wildly for the other side. Being a strong swimmer, she reached the bank, climbed out, and Clark politely invited us to follow. 
the one-eyed Napoleon was brought to the brink and induced to plunge in by an application of a fence-rail a turgo, his cyclopean organ piloting him safely across, when he was quickly followed by the other mules. We watched the load of instruments with some anxiety, and were not reassured when their heavy weight bore the mule quite under, but she climbed successfully out, and we ourselves, half swimming, half floundering, managed to cross. A little way farther we came upon another stream, rushing violently across the road, sweeping down logs and sections of fence. Here Clark dismounted, and we drove the whole train in. Three animals got safely over, but the instrument mule was swept downstream and badly snagged, lying upon one side with his head under the water. Cotter and Gardner and Clark ran upstream and got across upon a log. I made a dash for the snagged mule, and by strong swimming managed to catch one of his feet and then his tail and worked myself toward the shore. It was something of a task to hold his head out of the water, but I was quickly joined by the others, and we managed to drag him out by the head and tail. There he lay, upon the bank, on his side, tired of life, utterly refusing to get upon his feet, the most abominable specimen of inertia and indifference. While I was pricking him vigorously with a tripod, the ground caved under my feet and I quickly sank. Cotter, who was standing close by, seized me by the cape of my soldier's overcoat and landed me as carefully as he would a fish. As we marched down the road, unconsciously keeping step, the sound of our boots had quite a symphonic effect. They were all full of water and with soft, melodious slushing, acted as a calmer upon our spirits. The road in some places was cut out many feet deep, and we were obliged to climb upon the wooded banks and make laborious detours. At last we reached a branch of the Chowchilla, which was pouring in a flood between a man's house and his barn. Here we formed a line, a mule, between each two men. Our line was swept frightfully downstream, but the leader gained his feet, and we came out safe and dripping upon terra firma on the other side. A mile farther, we came upon the main Chowchilla, which was running a perfect flood. From being a mere brooklet, it had swollen to a considerable river, with waves five and six feet high, sweeping down its center. We formed our line and attempted the passage, but were thrown back. It would have been madness to try it again, and we turned sorrowfully back to the last ranch. Cotter and I piloted the animals over to the barn, and upon returning, threw a rope to our friends upon the other side, and were drawn through the swift water. In the ranch house we found two bachelors, typical California partners, who were quietly partaking of their supper of bacon, fried onions, Japanese tea and biscuits, which, like Harry York's, had too much saleratus. We stood upon their threshold a while and dripped, quite a rill descending over the two steps, trickling down the dooryard as a new fork of the Chowchilla. We asked for supper and shelter, but were met with such a gruff, inhospitable reply that we lost all sense of modesty, and walked in with all our moisture. We stretched a rope across the middle of the sitting room, before a huge fire and an open chimney, then, stripping ourselves to the buff, we hung up our steaming clothes on the line, and turned solemnly round and round before the fire, drying our persons. In the meanwhile, our inhospitable landlords made the best of the situation, and proceeded to achieve more onions and more saleratus biscuit for our entertainment. Upon our departure in the morning, the generous rancher charged us first-class hotel prices. The flood had utterly disappeared, and we passed over the Chowchilla with surprise and dry shoes. At Mariposa, 
we parted from Clark and devoted two whole days to struggling through the mud of San Joaquin Valley to San Francisco, where we arrived, wet and exhausted, just in time to get on board the New York steamer. On the morning of the twelfth day, Gardner and I seated ourselves under the grateful shadow of palm trees, a bewitching black and tan sister thrumming her guitar while the chocolate for our breakfast boiled. The slumberous haze of the tropics hung over Lake Nicaragua, but high above its indistinct pearly veil rose the smooth cone of the volcano Amatapec, robed in a cover of pale emerald green. Warmth, repose, the verdure of eternal spring, the poetical whisper of palms, the heavy odor of tropical blooms, banished the grand cold fury of the Sierra, which had left a permanent chill in our bones. End of chapter 8 A Sierra Storm <laughs>